Hi, everybody. I am Mark Braben, a senior advisor to Kinexus, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's webinar titled, Why Great Leaders Must Unlearn to Succeed in Today's Exponential World. And this is going to be presented by our special guest, Barry O'Reilly. Barry O'Reilly is a business advisor, entrepreneur, and author who has pioneered the intersection of business model innovation, product development, organizational design, and culture transformation. Barry works with business leaders and teams from global organizations that seek to invent the future, not fear it. Every day, Barry helps with some of the world's leading companies, from disruptive startups to Fortune 500 behemoths, break, helps them break the vicious cycles that spiral businesses toward death by enabling a culture of experimentation and learning to unlock the insights required for better decision-making, higher performance, and results. Barry is the author of, most recently, a book titled Unlearn, Let Go of Past Success to Achieve Extraordinary Results. And he's also co-author of the international bestseller, Lean Enterprise, How High-Performance Organizations Innovate at Scale, which is included in the Eric Ries book series. Barry is an internationally sought-after speaker, frequent writer, and contributor to The Economist, Strategy Plus Business, and MIT Sloan Management Review. Barry is uh, faculty at Singularity University, advising and contributing the Singularity's executive and accelerator programs based in San Francisco and throughout the globe. Barry is the founder of Exec Camp, the entrepreneurial experience for executives and management consultancy antennae. His mission is to help purposeful technology-led businesses innovate at scale. And with that, I will hand things over to Barry. Thank you for presenting today. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. It's a delight to be here. So uh, over 2,000 years ago, the seed of a civilization, uh, a startup, if you will, commenced at seven hills in Central Europe. Now, this startup would go on to scale and sustain itself for over 2,000 years uh, and become one of the greatest civilizations that humanity has known. At the peak of its power, the Roman Empire accounted for a, nearly a fifth of the world's population and covered over 2,000 square kilometers. Now, there's been lots of hypotheses about what enabled this small startup in Rome to not only scale but sustain itself for over 2,000 years. Does anybody know? Now, typically when I ask that question, I hear things like their roads, aqueducts, and governmental systems. But uh, the, the, the leading hypothesis, actually, that people believe as to what helped Rome grow, sustain, and scale itself for so long was none of these. Uh, the interesting part is that as soon as the Roman Empire, when they uh, conquered or incorporated uh, new countries, as soon as they found practices that were uh, better than their own, they let go of their existing practices and incorporated those new practices into their systems of operation. So in essence, they had to let go of what made them successful in the past to continue to achieve their extraordinary results. They had to unlearn. Now, this idea of unlearning is not necessarily something new. Um, in the sort of mid-90s, Peter Singh wrote in the seminal book, The Fifth Discipline, which sort of launched the concept of learning organizations and systems thinking in the business industry. And hundreds of executives were flying to high prestigious universities and spending weeks in classrooms learning how to become a learning organization. And, and it was the vogue idea of the time in the 1990s. But... Um, while everybody was interesting in understanding that learning or was in part of becoming a great learning organization, there was a sort of another idea that was, was equally important, but most people seem to miss. Uh, Bo Henley was one of the first people to describe that while learning is important, we also need to, to develop the skill to continuously unlearn. Because as knowledge grows, it also at the same time becomes obsolete as reality changes. So really what we need is not just a system that allows us to acquire new knowledge, but also discard obsolete or misleading knowledge that is no longer relevant to constantly adapt to the changing situations that we're in. Now, this was written in 1981. But when you look back at the type of companies that were leading the world, and 
even 10 years later, we sort of had this stagnant set of organizations that big companies would build big business models with moats around them to protect them. Even when people were becoming these learning organizations, and still, even 10 years after that, very little had changed. It was still very much about how big you could get and how much you could own. Until suddenly, everything changed. And companies that were in actually investing in building platforms that allowed them to learn at higher velocity, higher accuracy, and better rates about what their customers used and didn't use to continuously learn and unlearn what made them successful in the past, rapidly started to change the world. You see, for most leadership, they're sort of trapped in a little bit of a, a, a incremental view of the world. They believe the things that made them successful in the past can actually be the things that will be continue to make them successful in the future. Management have a very linear viewpoint about what things will make them successful. The things that worked yesterday will work tomorrow and incrementally will grow. And yet we're in a world of exponential innovation where things that may radically change when people use new technologies, new ways of working, that fundamentals of the business change, and yet management are still thinking in a very incremental manner. And this is where the gap appears. So when I hear a lot of people talk about disruption, businesses are being disrupted. The point is, it's not necessarily businesses that are disrupted. It's actually individuals. Businesses are just a collection of individuals and a set of leaders. And you have your behaviors, just like products have features. And if you're not continuously innovating your product features or your own behaviors, you're going to get stuck using features that nobody uses anymore, that are irrelevant or outdated as the context changes, the situation changes, the world changes. And this is really encapsulated nicely in a quote that I really like from Gary Hamill, where he talks about today we have the 21st century internet-enabled business processes and mid-20th century management processes all built on top of 19th century management principles. We're failing to unlearn. Technology is changing and radically shifting the way that we can solve customer problems, yet most people are still grounded in the industrial era of managers telling employees how to solve problems not letting technology allow people to connect with customers and solve the problems customers tell you they have. So often when I talk about uh, this concept of unlearning, most people get quite upset and they push back and say, so you're telling me everything you know, that I know is no longer relevant and nothing could be further from the truth. So the way I describe learning, uh, unlearning is like this. It's the conscious act of letting go of outdated information and actively engaging in taking in new information to inform effective decision-making and action. So it's, uh, th the concept here is that you need a system to continuously recognize what behaviors are working for you and driving the outcomes you want and what behaviors are obsolete, no longer useful, and should be let go to make space for new behaviors to come in. Now, this is really interesting to me. I coach, uh, as Mark talked in the, in, uh, the intro, I work with a lot of scaling companies here in San Francisco uh, and also coach a lot of executive teams and global corporates throughout the world. Um, and what I was finding was it was their, well, their ability to learn, and learning is tough, um, it wasn't the limiting factor in, in achieving higher performance. Really, it was their inability to let go of what they viewed this behaviors that had made them successful to date and unlearn that was holding them back. So it got me interested about how I could create a system to help people continuously experiment with new behaviors and adapt their behaviors to the outcomes they were aiming for. And having coached hundreds of executives through this process, I developed a cycle that I call the cycle of unlearning. And the idea is that, first of all, you have to recognize that you need to unlearn. Uh, recognize that there's an outcome that you're trying to achieve and your current behavior, thinking, methods, strategies are not actually driving that outcome and you need to unlearn. So really to get good in about describing the outcomes you're aiming for, crystallizing them and then thinking maybe there's a better way. Another reason you might recognize you need to unlearn is that you're not achieving or living up to the expectations that you have of yourself that you're struggling with a problem or tried all the methods you know and still not got the results. 
they're all sort of signals that it's time to unlearn. Then the next step is to relearn, is after you've defined the key outcome that you're aiming for, is create a safe environment where you can experiment with lots of new behaviors to see which work and which don't. Try and drive the outcomes that you want based on the new behaviors that you're experimenting with. And then the final step was this idea of breakthrough to sort of reflect on the results that you're getting from trying to relearn new behaviors or let go of existing behaviors. And using the data that you gather from applying those new behaviors to see if it's driving the outcomes you want. And what I constantly found is that while this wasn't sort of a one and done process, it was actually a system, a system to continually allow people to adapt their behavior. And actually, it became a virtuous system. The more you continually started to change your behavior and recognize the benefits of new behaviors or also letting go of existing behaviors, it became an accelerant, compounding people's ability to grow their and their adaptability to changing conditions. So this got me very excited because we're definitely in a world today where we constantly have to transform. Um, but the problem what I constantly saw with for a lot of leadership teams is that they would tell people that you need to transform, but not themselves. And even the way that we tried to transform organizations was flawed. Rather than trying to start these innovation projects on the edge of organizations, big, complex, adaptive systems that organizations are, I thought that if I wanted to influence those systems, those large, complex systems of organizations, I really need to focus my attention on the nodes that had the most influence on that system. And that caused me to start a, a company called ExecCamp. Now, the goal of ExecCamp is to launch, uh, I get executives to leave their business with the goal of launching new businesses to disrupt their existing business. And as a part of going through that process, just disrupt their sort of calcified behaviors and thinking by experimenting with new technologies, tools, and techniques. Now, most of the time when I tell people that I have executives leave in some instances of the, their company for two weeks, uh, people say that they want to know how poss it's possible. couldn't be possible. And I, I always, uh, the, the typical reaction I get is something like this, uh, a pure shock. But I always say to people, don't worry, I've got a diagram that wiggles and goes up to the right, so everything's okay. But really what I've found from going through this process of actually creating an experience for people to not only immerse themselves and, new, and ideate and innovate to drive impact in their company and scale it out, that there's a couple of characteristics you've got to cultivate within yourself if you're going to unlearn. The first one is curiosity. And what I mean by this is um, curiosity is the idea that how off open are you to new information? And the new information that essentially conflicts against your existing mental models. Simple example might be, When's the last time you asked someone on your team to perform a task that you've completed before? Uh, and their initial approach was to solve it in a radically different way than you would have solved it. Did you stop them and say, that's not the way to do it? You need to do it this way. Or were you curious to understand why they tackled it in a different way? It gives you a sense of how open are you to seeing how new information could be done. Ownership is the second point. So, when you're struggling and not achieving the outcomes that you want, what's your natural reaction? Do you point the finger at other people, say that they need to change? We'd be successful if that other team just did what I wanted them to do. See, ownership is about owning the results and recognizing that if you'd want to change the results, it's up to you to change your behavior to drive those outcomes rather than blaming or pointing fingers at other people. Commitment is the willingness to try new things. You're going to have to work in ways that are different that you're not used to. So you need to commit to a deliberate practice of experimentation to continuously try things that aren't natural to you and grow. And that means that you're going to have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, all our growth, all our impact, all the great progress steps we make happens when we're so, just on the edge of our comfort zone, a little bit like our, foot, our feet just touching the bottom uh, of of the, the beach when we're floating out in the water. That's where the magic happens. But the way that we make it safe for you to be curious, take ownership, commit, and be comfortable with being uncomfortable is we continually make it safe to, uh, to fail, safe to experiment, safe to succeed by thinking big, starting small, and creating fast feedback loops that allow us to learn quickly 
if what the experiments are running are working or not working. So what I would thought I would do today is to share some examples of uh, areas where I've worked and I've had to learn how to unlearn and coach people through that process. And then uh, we'll pause at the end for some questions, as Mark mentioned. So the first sort of uh, key piece to remember is uh, leadership mindset. And this is where I try us to think about that we even need to unlearn the way that we try to learn. And now one of the biggest problems uh, at the moment is currently for any new organizations or individuals when they want to learn something, they're typically sent off to a very prestigious education university or some some mentoring system where they're sat in a room for two days and, and talked at. Um, we spend somewhere in the region of $365 billion a year or invested in ex uh, executive development, but less than 25% of them say that it actually achieves any of the outcomes that they want. So it starts to show that if you're serious about educating people, less than one in four say that the education pro programs are driving the outcomes that you want. Therefore, we need to unlearn. Yet most people don't want to change that. They are comfortable to sit in a room and be told to think differently, but they don't act differently. And this is one of the subtle things about starting to drive shifts in mindset. If you want to shift people's mindset, you don't tell them to think differently. You've got to get them to start acting differently. You see, when you start to lead with changing your behavior, new behavior gives you a different perspective. By acting in a different way, you start to see the world in a different way. It gives you new information. And that new information runs contrary to your existing mindset. It impacts your mindset and has to make you aggregate new types of information versus what you believe versus what you're actually seeing. It tests your assumptions. And then as your mindset starts to shift, that encourages you to keep changing your behavior to experience new things. So often what I say to people is that if you want to shift mindset, you don't get people to think differently you get people to start acting differently, experience the world in a different way, and that's what starts to shift their mindset. So one of the examples uh, of a company I work with is International Airlines Group. Now, uh, International Airlines Group is the holding company for uh, airlines that you might know, such as Aer Lingus, British Airways, Felling, uh, and Iberian. It's the sixth largest uh, airline company in the world and has about 63,000 employees. Now, what I did was take six of their senior executive team out of their business for eight weeks with the goal of trying to launch new businesses to disrupt both the airline industry and the company and themselves. Uh, and it was really interesting, even from the very first time when we started to do some experimentation, I was trying to get the leadership team or one of the executives to come up with ideas that could transform the airline industry. Now, they were positive uh, based on their 20 years in their industry, the expertise, their know-how. They know, knew exactly what customers wanted. All we had to do was listen to their idea and implement it. So one of the things I tried to do was get the executive then to actually sit down and test that idea with a real customer. So how do you think it went? Well, it didn't go very well at all. They showed it to a customer, and the customer didn't get it at all. And what do you think the executive's reaction was? Well, it was the wrong customer. Go get me another customer. So we sort of went through this cycle about four or five times. where was constantly sitting down with an executive as he was trying to push his ideas onto the customer. Based on his experience, his expertise in the industry, he knew the answer. And yet no customer could understand the solution he was putting forward. So I sat down after we did this a couple of times. And I asked the executive to sort of reflect on the results they were getting. Very quickly he said to me, I figured out what the problem is. It's not the customer. It's me. It's the idea. So instead of pushing my ideas onto customers, I should be pulling my information from them. So next time he ran the experiment and customers said it stuck, he was like, that's great. Why, why, how can I make it better? Now, this was really interesting for an executive like that because it reactivated his curiosity. He actually realized that his expertise was a limiting part of his idea hypothesis. That, and he started to see lots of his assumptions about how businesses worked really as hypotheses, hypotheses to be tested as quickly and cheaply as possible. Now, that executive went on to be one of the best experimenters I think I ever worked with. 
Um, he started running all sorts of experiments around his business and encouraging his teams to start to do that. The sort of culminating force was, um, I think about two months after the program, he sent me an email where one of his team members had uh, came into his office and said, I, uh, you know, I need you to sign off this new product we're going to launch. And his response was, why are you asking me to test it? You should be out in the airport getting our customers to test it, get them to sign it off. It showed this sort of mental breakthrough that they went through, uh, uh, achieved. And then how they also propagated that breakthrough virtuously and scaled it out across their organization. Now, while the uh, innovation at IAG, uh, or the eight-week program, the exec camp we did was phenomenal, we came up with the first identity management system for blockchain. Uh, we created processing systems of customer complaints that used to take months and minutes. You know, a lot of the ideas that came out of the program, we thought we could just push them back into the company and expect teams to pick them up. But that just led to a disastrous scenario where we essentially took a whole load of money and just burnt it on the runway. Now, these teams already had their own ideas about how to innovate the organizational business. They had no capacity. They were already fully loaded with the things that needed to be done. So we still made the same mistake of trying to push ideas into the company rather than on our customers, rather than pull ideas. But there was an interesting way that we also unlearned that. We recognized that there's other ways that we could try and innovate within organizations and not try to push ideas onto the company. So IAG came up with this idea of Hangar 51, which was the first venture capital firm uh, ever to be created in the airline industry. And what they would do is start to make their assets available to startups, where startups could actually use the data and skill and resources that the airline industry, the airline had, and then build their own products and services on top of it. Yeah, getting the best capabilities from startups using the best capabilities from uh, scale-ups and enterprises. And as a result, uh, IAG would take a, a stake in the organization and help it succeed. So there was all sorts of interesting ways of unlearning that would start to happen in IAG to drive these amazing business results. And Stephen Scott, who was the chief innovation officer for IAG, but now runs their Avios loyalty program, would continually say that when 97% of people say that you should stop doing what you're doing, that's when the breakthrough is just about to happen. And you actually need to increase your velocity of experimentation rather than try and stop to get the breakthroughs that you need. So one of the interesting parts then again about this idea of expertise is we need to unlearn uh, being a know-it-all and actually relearn how to become a learn-it-all. Uh, one of my clients is a really well-known uh, phone manufacturer, and they had a pro they had a, a business strategy that the leadership team were rolling out across their organization, and they were convinced, having their 20 years in the industry, that the system was the strategy was perfect. It was going to work excellency. And they couldn't understand the results that they were getting. So one of the things I constantly try and do with leadership teams is I'm trying to create scenarios where they can safely taste their assumptions about how products and services are operating. Uh, there's a really interesting show I think some people might be familiar with called Undercover Boss, where people who are in the leadership team of companies are about to become a senior leader act as if they're an employee of the company. Uh, unbeknownst to all the employees of the company as they go around and interview them. So I created this scenario where five of a senior leadership team of this company, had to, I gave them a credit card uh, loaded with enough that they could sign up for their own service and uh, under the terms of the service that they were offering. So they said that they could connect any company uh, in a, or any person in under two hours to their service. So they went out and tried to sign up for their own services. How do you think they got on? Well, the short answer is not so great. Only one in the five were able to actually sign up within the strategy constraints that they had defined. Another person nearly did it, but three failed miserably. Now, initially, when they came back uh, after doing that small experiment, they were quite frustrated. They were angry with the employee hadn't served them right, that the ticket machine wasn't working correctly. But then this is where I had to push them to own the results. Upon reflection, they, were, they realized that the ownership was on them. They were responsible for creating the strategy and rolling it out. Therefore, the results it wasn't achieving against the assumptions that they had. 
meant that they needed to unlearn what was working and relearn new ways to get there. But it was a great unlearning moment for a lot of them to try and actually be customers of their own products and experience and find out what assumptions they believe to be true were actually invalid and then use that as a way to improve their systems and design. And there's lots of people now who are starting to really power ahead by moving away from being a know-it-all to a learn-it-all. Uh, you might be familiar with this guy. He's John Lagarde. He's the now uh, CEO of T-Mobile. So when John initially took the job uh, what, as a CEO, often when people ask, well, how do you find out about how your business is operating? Most CEOs expect that they'll get reports up and down the organization, that their leadership team will tell them what needs to be fixed. But John took a radically different approach. He did none of that. Instead of listening or interviewing uh, or hear, being told internally in his team what was wrong, he had a, a phone line installed in his office. And he would sit there and listen to customer complaints for four hours every day to learn how his customers were struggling with their product and services, what were working and what not. Now, in a highly commoditized industry like the telco business, the only way you win is by taking market share away from your competitors. Um, so based on what John was hearing, he started to realize that people were struggling. They didn't understand how their data plans worked. Uh, no one knew how much their bill was going to be, how much they'd spend on data. Uh, and this is all in sort of the early 2010s. So based on what he heard from the phone calls, John launched this concept called OnCarrier. OnCarrier was the first actual um, mobile network program where you would pay a fixed fee every month, uh, which would include a fixed set of minutes and also data plan. So you always knew how much you'd be spending and what you could use it and unuse. And that literally obliterated the market. It took uh, the market by storm and T-Mobile started to gather more and more customers, both locally and internationally. But it didn't stop there for John. He started to unlearn even more things. From March 2003, he would shred a two-year uh, uh, service contract and do things differently, right up to giving people opportunities to try out new iPhones when they came out. All different methods that he continuously learned from listening to his customers and unlearning what was working and relearning new methods that would allow them to out-innovate and power ahead of their competition. And this method isn't just in the air, uh, airline industry. It isn't just in the telco industry. It's in new emergent industries that are powering ahead. Um, I was at uh, Amazon Web Services Summit in, in Re it's called reInvent in Las Vegas this year. And Werner Vogels, who's the CTO of Amazon.com, got up and shared how Amazon decide what they're going to build. 95% of their features and services are built on, built on customer feedback. They aren't pushing for services onto their customers. They're pulling services from their customers to out-innovate their, their competition and power ahead. So the last uh, point I just wanted to talk a little bit about was, was, was mistakes. Because one of the things uh, we often hear about organizations that struggle to innovate is people are afraid to make mistakes. But I guess my argument to me is that mistakes can actually be the biggest competitive advantage of your, your organization because they teach us something about what we thought was true and not true. One country, a company that has, it's really expensive to make mistakes is NASA. So when NASA launched um, the Columbia uh, space mission, or sorry, uh, Challenger, which exploded uh, on takeoff, it was one of the biggest sort of shocks to the uh, U.S. And, and the world. The space program had been a massive success. Um, so when the, the rocket exploded on, on launch, it, it caused a lot of people to lead to catastrophic failure and loss of life. Um, but the question is that most people within NASA at the time still felt like it was an act of God, that it was something that just happened, couldn't have been planned. So many of the behaviors that had worked in NASA, people didn't really see it as a point that they needed to change until the Columbia disaster, which broke apart uh, upon re-entry. Now, uh, Ed, uh, Dr. Ed Hoffman was the chief knowledge officer at NASA, and Ed would always say that when you had lots and lots of smart people, usually they had to fail uh, really big before it became important for them to change. And, and, and that was a struggle for the organization. 
lots of people were really smart, so they were used to being right, and they weren't used to sharing mistakes. Now, the powerful thing about mistakes is mistakes are new information. They show you that your assumptions are not what you actually believed. And if you can create systems to easily share mistakes across your organization, it actually becomes the ability to help people have the best information to make the best decisions. And there are sort of two ways that you sort of drive this change in organizations. Uh, Eggerstein, who's the prim- uh, one of the primary thinkers in organizational cult, talks about two levers that drive people's behaviors. He talks about learning anxiety and survival anxiety. Now, survival anxiety is a shock. If you don't do something, your business is going to be disrupted. If you don't take action, your systems could lead to catastrophic failures. It's a way to sort of peak people to take action. But the endless tap, uh, it works for a while and then it sort of it sort of maxes out, right? People sort of hear their company's going to be disrupted all the time, but like five years later, they're still in business. So it doesn't drive long-term sustainable change. The one thing that does, though, is learn is reducing learning anxiety. And that's how safe people feel to try new things, to share things that they're working, to experiment, to grow, and, and mistakes. And mistakes are an important part of that. So the way me and Ed try and describe this idea of why you have this pyramid of advantage or catastrophe is in any business, lots of little mistakes happen. Things that you thought were going to happen, um, but, but uh, you achieved a different result. But there's no ever harm. The system doesn't break down and people aren't injured. Then you have mishaps where you complete a mission, but there was a failure, but it just didn't cause the mission to fail. And then the the high point is um, catastrophic failure. And this is examples of what happened with the space shuttle, where there were mis- mistakes that turned into mishaps and ultimately drove catastrophic failures across the organization. So really what we want to try and do is create a system to capture mistakes and share mistakes to avoid them becoming mishaps and mishaps ultimately becoming catastrophic failures. Now, This requires, though, people being comfortable with sharing mistakes and having high levels of safety in your organization where people don't feel like they'll be judged. One of the problems NASA had is that there's lots of bright people, so they're afraid to say that they're not bright or they made a mistake. Would that mean that they're not bright? Um, But when we start to look at the reasons uh, about creating high-performance teams, Google did a very famous um, study of what created high-performance teams called the Aristotle Project. And what they discovered was it's not how smart you are. It's not knowing how many M&Ms it takes to fill the Empire State Building. Now, the number one uh, indicator for high-performance teams was psychological safety, how how safe the team feel to take risks or be vulnerable in front of one another, share their mistakes. So what me and Ed started to realize is that we needed to create a system that people within NASA could easily share mistakes with one another So they would stop becoming mishaps and avoid catastrophic failures. Now, to change the culture of organization is hard. You have to get down to specifics. Culture is a very abstract thing. So our first goal was to try and create safety and then very simply start to share mistakes. So Ed got together the senior leaders of all the different departments. On a regular cadence, every month they used to sit down and share one mistake that they had made, but how making that mistake had led to some And catching that mistake had led to them avoiding a mishap and ultimately catastrophic failure. And he would get people from different departments across NASA to start sharing these stories and leaders to start sharing these stories to encourage other people in their teams to start sharing their mistakes. And this started to propagate a whole system across the entire organization, breaking down silos about where people were afraid to share things that had actually resulted in things they didn't expect. But by sharing that information, it led them to create a more resilient system because everybody was aware of things that worked and didn't work. Therefore, they were creating systems to catch mistakes early rather than allow them to become mishaps and ultimately catastrophic failures. Now, today, most uh, less than 20, I think it's 40 percent of NASA employees were actually around when NASA had these catastrophic failures with Challenger and Columbia. So one of the things they do to continuously, now that they've tackled learning anxiety, to to constantly not let complacency sit in and peak survival anxiety, uh, every year on the 26th of January, they shut down all of NASA 
and they invite the families and friends of the pilots and astronauts that were killed in both of those disasters <coughs> to share their stories about how much they missed their family, things that had worked, things that didn't work, what they would do differently. So they're trying to constantly just peak survival anxiety so people don't get let complacency set in, constantly work hard to share mistakes, to avoid mishaps and ultimately catastrophic failures. So one of the things I want you to think about at the end of this pro, uh, discussion is if you're going to try and create these great cultures, if you're going to try and create a culture of learning and unlearning, is you need to think big about an aspiration or outcome that you're aiming for but you, and start small and much more smaller than you think so you can have to start to unlearn today. So a simple little exercise I ask people to do is this. I want you to think um, about a current challenge or aspiration or outcome you're aiming for. Write, write it down on a piece of paper. And then find somebody that you trust in your network, within the organization, within business. And ask them, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you think your current behavior is driving you towards that outcome? And they'll score you between 1 and 10. Maybe they say 7. Ask them, what's one thing you could do that would make you half a point better? Just half a point. What's one new behavior you could try or behavior you could stop? And whatever they come up with, experiment with it. Try it for a week. Try that new behavior or stop in the behavior they've recommended and see how you progress. Check back with them and say, last week I was a seven. What am I this week based on the new behaviors I've adopted? And straight away, you'll start to be using this system of unlearning, describing the outcomes that you want, starting to unlearn, relearning with new behaviors that you're trying to do, and get, get breakthroughs by reflecting about the results you're achieving, what you need to do differently. And then you can start to become scale your success. You know, because it's not about being smart. It's not about having great skills and capabilities. It's about intentionally practicing and experimenting with new behaviors all the time. Serena Williams is, was a huge inspiration for me in writing on Unlearn. And today she even reads the book and incorporating into how she's driving uh, amazing results to become one of the greatest athletes potentially the world has ever seen. So the, the leading points I want you to think about are this. Uh, when you're tackling these new uh, ideas of unlearning, it's about thinking big but starting small. It's about choosing courage over comfort, courage to try new behaviors, new methods that are uncomfortable. So don't let yourself get too comfortable. And the way that you scale is by making it safe, create a safe environment where people can experiment safely and learn and relearn with new behaviors to try and drive the breakthroughs that they're looking for. So if you're curious to uh, unlearn more, uh, you can go and check out the book here. Uh, it's available on Audible or an audiobook uh, as well as in stores. My name's been Barry O'Reilly. It's been a pleasure to share um, some of the concepts within Unlearning and my experiences helping organizations do it. If you want to connect, there's lots of options here about how you can reach out to me or follow what I'm doing. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Barry. Really appreciate, um, there's a lot to think about and, and chew on there and, and we'll wait for more questions to come in. And while we do that, I um, want to just make a few quick announcements. Our next webinar coming up uh, is actually going to be hosted basically by our friends at Lean Frontiers. Um, that's going to be held on March 12th. You can find a link to register for that at kinexus.com slash webinars. You'll see the title of the webinar, Simple CI, Creating a CI or Continuous Improvement Process that is easy for anyone to follow. So if you are a regular uh, participant, attendee in our webinars, the registration page is going to look a little bit different because again, that is being the registration and hosting is being done uh, by Lean Frontiers who, who put on events like uh, Kodakon, um, and um, other other great events throughout the year, the Lean Coaching Summit, events like that. I'm going to be moderating and asking questions of the main presenter, Mike Wiersma from Whirlpool, 
they are a Kinexus customer and they're going to be talking about how they combine methodologies like uh, Toyota Kata, A3 problem solving, and, and how they incorporate all of that and the use of the Kinexus platform into their lean transformation journey, particularly in areas outside of manufacturing. So I hope that's of interest. Again, March 12th, it's open uh, to, to anyone who wants to sign up for that. Our podcast series is available. You can find more at kinexus.com slash podcast. If you want to revisit the audio from uh, Barry's webinar or check out anything else um, from um, our, our past webinars, you can subscribe uh, via iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. The full audio of today's webinar will be out in the podcast feed. And as you see down there, uh, Clint Corley, what would you say you do here? Um, I was inspired, we were inspired by the 20th anniversary of the movie Office Space. And so we're basically doing a series where we ask people from the Kinexus team, we started with Greg Jacobson, our CEO, the question the Bobs asked, what would you say you do here, at least as a, a way to get that conversation started, if you want to learn more about the people you might be interacting with at Kinexus. So beyond that, um, there are additional resources. The full continuous improvement webinar library is available on demand. You can find a link to that by going to kinexus.com slash webinars. And I'd also invite you to check out our blog, which you can find at blog.kinexus.com. And if you're a customer, there's actually a secondary blog. If you click where it says customer blog, um, there are a lot of posts about new features and, and things that we think you would be interested in. And then the improvement blog is certainly open uh, to anybody who wants to read that. So with that, let's, uh, let's go into um, Q&A and, and Barry's contact info um, will, will be up there on screen as well. Okay, so you've had a chance to have a sip of water or a sip of tea and catch your breath, Barry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just big deep breaths. <laughs> nice sip of water. Yeah. I'm ready. All right. So my question here, um, how would you suggest we influence this type of change and creating a safe environment from the middle of the organization? Um, what have you seen work well for people who need to coach up? And um, so a little bit like those examples I was trying to show earlier with um, the executive team of a well-known uh, phone manufacturing group and uh, also a little bit the sort of method that John Agurge tried to institute on himself. You know, like mo most senior leaders have assumptions about how the world works. And often uh, as you're sort of not hesitant to say lower down in the organization, but you're closer to where the action is happening. Uh, and on a daily basis you know, when you're in the middle or the front line. Uh, uh, so often what you see is that executives are making decisions based on the information they get, the assumptions that they have, and they're good decisions based on the, that information. Um, it's just that information can be incorrect. So what I'm constantly trying to do with people um, is create safe experiments where they can test those assumptions and learn that they're either valid, invalid, or something should be done. So when you're in the middle of the organization and you're seeing both the information flowing up from the people at the front line and the information flowing down um, from, the, from above, you're in this unique position to see where they're in contrast or contradiction with one another. So I'm constantly trying to find way, encourage ways where you in that role can help senior leaders get the right information um, and yeah, people at the bottom of the organization surface the correct information and not sanitize it. <clears throat> and that, that's why those scenarios like getting executives to be customers of their own business and seeing what happens and seeing what they think is true is not true. But the way you make it safe is not tell 100,000 people in your company that you're going to get your executive to run this experiment and find out what they think is true is not true is you make it safe by you do it small. You create a safe environment where the executive can learn what works and what doesn't. So they're not failing in front of the whole organization because that mm. drives the different types of behavior. You know, and, and invariably every time I've created those scenarios where the executives can actually learn what's the real information, they're delighted because then they can make a better decision on better information. You know, and, and, and that technique is not new. 
you know, all these techniques like management by walking around that were instituted in HP or what Steve Blank would call get out of the building and talk to your customers. They're all simple ways for people to check their assumptions and find out if they're actually true or not uh, to make a better decision. So I think one of the things I'd encur- always encourage you if you're in the middle of these organizations is you do have this unique position to see what's actually happening, the reality versus what people believe is happening. And then how can you create a simple, small experiment where your leaders can actually start to see that uh, real information so they can make better decisions? Okay, um, here's another question. Do you, you, since you work with companies of different sizes, do you find that big companies are the ones who most need to make it safe to fail? Is this something that's more inherent in startups? And when in the company's life cycle do startups somehow learn that failure is bad? Well, I, I don't think this is problem uh, is, is categorized by a startup or, or scale up or, or an enterprise organization. You know, like like what I constantly find is if people have mechanisms in place to allow them experiment and recover quickly, whether they get intended or unintended consequences of the experiment, that's what allows people to move fast. So, you know, one of the reasons Amazon, which is a massive company, is able to innovate so quickly is they've invested heavily in technology platforms that allow them to experiment very cheaply. So just to give you a sense, in 2011, Amazon were doing a software deployment every 11 seconds. So that that means every 11 seconds, they are learning something new about what works and what doesn't work about their business. They're learning and unlearning. So it means that they can iterate rapidly and also iterate safely. If they make a change that doesn't work, doesn't get the, you know, essentially they fail, they can make another deployment 11 seconds later and recover from that failure. So it gives you a sense um, about that creates safety in their technology platforms. It gives them more confidence to make different types of bets. You know, to, and it, we're in a startup world. You know, startups might feel like they can go out and they'll talk to customers, uh, any customer, and they're not afraid to put new features out to see if the market likes them or not, because they know if they can iterate fast, it, it's safe to fail. So I think the thing I would get everybody to think about is when you're designing your experiments, this is why it's important to think big, have a big aspiration or outcome that you're aiming for, but start small. What's the smallest thing you can do to start de-risking that thinking big hypothesis, a small experiment to learn fast if it works or not? You know, one of the things I constantly say to teams is our goal is not to fail fast. It's to learn fast if we have failed or we've been successful. So think about this idea of thinking big, but starting small and learning fast about whether you're achieving the outcomes you want or not, and then iterating. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean, you, know, you talk about the idea of reducing risk by creating small tests of change and iteration cycles. I mean, this is, this is classic Toyota thinking without putting the Toyota wrapper around it, right? I mean, if it's a- absolutely. Uh, that's really, uh, really powerful stuff. Um, oh, all right. It's just it's an open-ended question, or let's see. So um, do you have any ideas, maybe from experiences as uh, being a patient, about things that healthcare needs to unlearn? Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm a pa- I suffer from Crohn's disease, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, a regular user of health systems. You know, oh, okay. and I and I've had to travel internationally and go go through many different systems, both in Australia, Europe, and America. You know, and I think uh, one of the things that has, has has definitely struck me is I can tell when I'm in a highly siloed system versus whether I'm in a, a cross functional system or where where people who are ultimately owning my health outcomes are clear on what's happening to me and making decisions as a team versus making them independently. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, uh, I, so many systems I've experienced that. And a um, simple example is, uh, you know, definitely in the U.S. system, what I've been impressed with is the, all of the information from my blood tests to anything that happens to me is, is centralized in one system. 
But the problem is that system is locked into just one supplier. So when yeah. I try to have to move to a different supplier outside of the network, they don't get access to any of that information. So they can't make a good decision very quickly. Right. And, and, but what mm-hmm. I notice when I'm inside a system that has access to my information, they have this holistic view of me and they can also collaborate much better with people inside that system to make good decisions for my ultimate health outcomes. So it's, it's always interesting to sort of see the sort of unintended consequences and effect of that. And, and really what I'm finding is the more that you can create um, this cross-functional breakdown silos within systems overall right. mm-hmm. and allow a cross-functional team of healthcare people understand, especially with my illness, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just a gastroenterologist that's going to fix me. There's uh, dietary pieces. There's um, people who are monitoring uh, my, my blood intake, my, uh, you know, there's, there's my exercise levels. There's lots of things that contribute to my health outcomes. Um, mm-hmm. But when you get stuck in the silos, um, I think you see a lot of decisions that, that make sense to, to one individual, but not to me overall for my health outcomes. Yeah, I think that that's a longstanding habit. Um, that's not just there. There are some dysfunctions that are unique to American healthcare, But I think the idea of silos um, and the, 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 the need to unlearn what helped clinicians or, or hospitals become great in the past. And correct me if I'm wrong, this seems like this follows your line of thinking that there, there are certain behaviors that helped people be successful in the past of narrow focus and, 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 and really understanding your part of the work very um, deeply. But, you know, Atul Gawande and, and others, healthcare writers and thinkers, you know, point out that the number of people involved in an individual patient's care has exploded in recent decades. And that, that seems to have create, created new coordination challenges that healthcare is still trying to figure out how to address. The world changed on them, right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, and especially someone like me who moves globally all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like my, my illness is, is going to move with me, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, but like having this idea of when I go to, into new health systems and how difficult it is for me to transition and the, the cost it takes for me to ramp up in a new health system, uh, you know, both energy, financial, you name it, of both of those systems, right? Like, um that could make like global healthcare more efficient if there was a single view of single view of me and regardless of where you know people access that data that I'm happy to share with them um, yeah. you know that, that that would make all those healthcare systems globally more efficient it's big big opportunities there for sure um and let, let's, I could talk about healthcare all day, but there, there's some other questions here. Um, do, do you have examples of um, any, are there any exercises you use to help people cultivate curiosity? Is that something that's a fixed trait or is that something that can actually be grown and developed? No, um, this, is, this is my top hack for helping you improve your curiosity. And especially if you're a senior leader, right? If you're, if you're mentoring or giving advice to people regularly, you, you develop this behavior to give answers straight away. And really, um, th- the question, or the skill is to get better at asking questions and then not answering them. And it, the simple example is this. I coach a senior executive for a really well-known bank. And um, he's used to constantly, when his team's run, being in meetings, like all the time, all the time in meetings. And, and I often ask him, like, how effective are these meetings? Do, do, do you ever pause to ask that question? So one of the things I got him to institute is at the end of uh, every meeting he goes to, five minutes before it ends, I just ask him to ask a simple question. Ask people in the room, you know, what outcomes have we achieved from this meeting? And then for him just to be quiet and then go around the room and, and hear what people have to say. Because this, this sort of gives him an opportunity to check his assumptions about, did they understand the message he conveyed in the meeting? Did they achieve the purpose of the meeting? And by letting other people sort of talk and, and him essentially be quiet or shut up, he gets all this new information. Um, so, you know, what I would encourage you to do, especially if you're in leadership roles, is get better at asking questions rather than telling people the answers. 
And the way to do that is to find ways that you can ask questions like, did we achieve the outcomes we want from this session? And then be quiet and then let people yeah. tell you what they've taken away from it. And that's yeah. a simple way that you can start to be curious in the way that you work. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned Edgar Schein. I mean, I, I for one, you know, recommend his books, um, Helping and Humble Inquiry. He's got other books in the series, Humble Consulting, Humble Leadership, I believe is, you know, but a lot of this is really focused on getting better at asking open-ended questions. Yeah, and it's it's such a, a powerful skill, you know, and and I think even to land the, the Toyota sort of analogy, you know, like when people pull the Andon cord at Toyota, the manager doesn't come over with the answers. They come over with a set of questions to help the employee find the answers. Right. And I think that's, that's again, just another simple example of the power of that mechanism. Um, yeah. So here's another question. Um, just out of curiosity, when you get, when organizations call you in, what are some of the scenarios they ask you about? I'm guessing it's probably less direct than help us unlearn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I think mo most of um, the reason companies invite me in is they're not achieving the outcomes that they're aiming for. Uh, they don't, they aren't even clear what the outcomes they're aiming for are. And, you know, like they're not living up to their expectations and are they're in search of higher performance, right? And um, so a lot of my work, a lot of the time, is helping leaders and teams define what great is that they're aiming for and, and getting alignment around that. And then teaching them um, like new methods and new behaviors that they can experiment with to try and drive the outcomes they want and sort of coaching them through that process, both building a system of accountability but also giving them some inspiration and ideas that they can try to get their methods, tools, and techniques, much, much like the examples we shared here today. Um, so that, that, that's, that's a very typical way for me to work with companies, and, and I uh, really enjoy it. Okay, um, so we're getting close to the top of the hour. Any other kind of final thoughts or tips or advice that you would want to leave the audience with, Barry? No, I just think that the one thing I would encourage you after listening to this um, webinar is like just pick one thing that you can try and do differently today. But don't like waste your investment of the last hour and just listen to what I've said and say that's great. You know, try and institute one new behavior that you can experiment with um, and that will get you start acting differently and hopefully you'll start to see a different result. And that will kick you off in your cycle of unlearning. Yeah, and the, it's classic, I think, time-tested advice. It's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. So, um, Barry O'Reilly, really want to thank you for uh, joining us today and, and sharing thoughts. So I encourage people to go, um, go get the book, Unlearn. And I would also encourage you, again, to come uh, register for the next webinar on March 12th, um, come learn how Whirlpool Corporation has seen broad support for continuous improvement as the result of using Kinexus and other great things that they're doing there. So you can find the link to that at kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, and again, Barry, thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me.